oil tanker ran aground today off the nation's northernmost ice-free port, Valdez, Alaska. One of the worst oil spills in U.S. history brought Americans' images of blackened beaches, dying wildlife, outrage, and betrayal. The evidence is that the response was slow and inadequate. Blame soon centered on the tanker captain. It is now clear that the captain of the tanker, who was not on the bridge at the time of the accident, had been drinking. But the accident also exposed the inattention to oil industry safety and led to promises to repair the damage that had been done. We will consider whatever it takes to keep you whole. And to do more to stop future spills. We also rededicate ourselves to transportation safety and to realistic planning for accidents that do occur. Nearly 25 years later, what happened to the promises made in the wake of the Exxon Valdez? The Gulf spill might already be as much as three times worse than the Exxon Valdez disaster. Just past midnight on March 24th, the supertanker Exxon Valdez crashed into a reef off the coast of southern Alaska. One of America's most magnificent waterways is blackened and befouled tonight by the biggest oil spill in American history. 240,000 barrels, 11 million gallons of Alaskan crude oil escaped from the huge vessel. The oil industry's response plans had promised a swift cleanup in the event of a spill. But Ricky Ott was alarmed when she flew over the wreck. We're nine hours after the wreck, and there was not a speck of promised recovery equipment on the water. This had all been promised within six hours, and we were three hours past six hours, and nothing. Neither Exxon nor Alieska, the oil pipeline company in charge of the immediate response, was ready for such a large spill. Alieska was supposed to have an emergency response team at its terminal in Valdez, but eight years ago the team was disbanded. The response vessels were either under snow or being repaired. They were completely overwhelmed. Coast Guard didn't quite know what to do. Equipment to fight this spill has to be flown in from as far away as Texas and England. Exxon says it's using all available resources, but it argues the spill is simply too big to surround with booms and skim it up. As images of the spill appeared on the evening news, Exxon began limited tests of chemical dispersants to try to break up the oil. The dispersants were controversial, and it was unclear if they would work or cause even more harm. The chemicals that you use to cause the oil to sink is very dangerous to marine life, and we have to be certain that we cause a minimal amount of damage. But it was soon too late to matter. Winds up to 70 miles an hour virtually shut down the oil spill cleanup operation this morning. The storm had come up and the oil was moving and almost nothing could be done. Some crews are literally on their knees using absorbent towels to remove the oil from rocky beaches. Less than 15% of the oil was recovered. News cameras captured the damage. 800 miles of shoreline already covered with oil. And the anger. This should have been the easiest spill in the world to clean up. Growing questions about how future disasters of this kind can be prevented and why there was such a slow response to this spill. At the same time, another storyline was also taking hold. The Exxon spokesperson says there might have been a problem with Captain Hazel, which seems he had a bit of a drinking problem. Good evening. The captain was drinking. The captain has been fired. That is the sum of it from Alaska tonight. The story became Hazelwood. Top 10 excuses of the Exxon the tanker captain. Number 10 was trying to scrape ice off reef for margarita. <laughs> That's a sensational kind of story. You have an immediate assignment of responsibility, an immediate villain. What was lost in all of that was the company's responsibility. When a pipeline to bring oil from northern Alaska to Valdez was approved in 1973, the oil industry and the federal government promised to make safety a priority. The Alaska pipeline's on its way. The environment will be saved. The government initially supported double-hull tankers and a high-tech navigation system in Valdez. 
We were given blanket assurances about safety and spills. In retrospect, I erred in not making sure that almost that what was said was not put in writing. Those promises never materialized. And when the state of Alaska passed its own safety law, the oil industry sued, saying the law infringed on federal authority. The court threw out the state's plan, so no double hull tankers, much more freedom to determine where the navigation channel would be. When the pipeline first opened, tankers were closely monitored by the Coast Guard and stayed in the shipping lanes even when they were clogged with ice flows. Instead of diverting out of the channel, they were supposed to slow down. But by the time the Exxon Valdez left port, the Coast Guard routinely allowed ships to leave the channel to avoid the increasing amount of ice. Slowing down was not something they want to do because time is money. Judging by our radar, I will probably divert from the TSS and end up in the inbound lane if there's no conflicting traffic over. A few minutes after that message, the Coast Guard wasn't monitoring the Valdez on its radar. The Coast Guard is supposed to be the check in case the ship makes a mistake. And they weren't, they weren't watching the ship. Captain Hazelwood turned the bridge over to third mate Gregory Cousins and went to his quarters after giving instructions to maneuver around the ice. Did you have any concerns about uh, getting past the ice? Not at that time, not at that instant, no. Cousins continued going south, heading directly into Bly Reef. A federal investigation later found that Cousins lost track of the ship's location and didn't turn back in time. It found that reduced tanker crews probably left Cousins overworked and tired, contributing to the accident, a conclusion Cousins and Exxon disputed. The investigation faulted Hazelwood for leaving the bridge and said his judgment was impaired by alcohol. Hazelwood denied he was drunk and was later acquitted of criminal charges related to drinking. Did they have some fault? Yes. But the real fault was there wasn't the safety net. Exxon spent more than $2 billion cleaning up the spill and says there was no long-term environmental damage. But pockets of oil remain beneath the surface of some beaches more than two decades later. Prince William Sound is not the same as it was. The environment still has not fully recovered, and we're over two decades into this now. Exxon paid $300 million to those hurt by the spill, and a jury later awarded another $5 billion in punitive damages. Exxon appealed, delaying the case for 14 years and leaving lasting bitterness in Alaska. 4,000 of the original plaintiffs have died since the Exxon Valdez. In 2008, the Supreme Court cut punitive damages to a tenth of the original amount. The community is still very depressed. Fishermen like Mike Weber say the local economy never recovered. 500 people left. That's a lot in a small community. You know, I'll never recover from, from the oil spill. After the spill, Exxon became an industry leader in safety and millions of federal dollars were designated for cleanup research. Congress required better contingency planning, double hull tankers, and tugboat escorts in Prince William Sound. We were now making traffic out of Valdez probably the safest line of passage anywhere in the globe. The explosion happened at the Deepwater Horizon rig Tuesday night. Now everyone's hoping and praying that the Gulf of Mexico rig doesn't turn into an environmental disaster. We're going to fight it, subsea, on the surface, and on the shore. After the BP oil spill, a presidential commission found that many lessons of the Exxon Valdez had been forgotten in the pursuit of offshore oil drilling. I used the phrase that the offense got way ahead of the defense the potential risk had increased dramatically, but there'd been no commensurate increase in our capability to avoid an accident or to respond to it. It found that the major oil companies had made only a minimal investment in new response technology, and the government spent less than half the authorized amount on cleanup research. The emphasis is always on preventing these things from occurring, because sure. when they happen, we're not very well equipped to deal with them. 
The news was again filled with the struggle to contain a massive spill. Using much of the same crude cleanup technology used 20 years earlier. We're still relying on booms, still relying on skimmers, still relying on shovels. And response plans that were again unrealistic. Lawmakers are alarmed that BP's competitors have given the government nearly identical emergency response plans. Those plans include steps to protect wildlife that does not even live in the Gulf. And the government authorized BP to use nearly two million gallons of dispersants, though many of the same questions were still unanswered. The key question that scientists are trying to figure out is whether oil dispersants in the deep ocean do more harm than good. The commission also found that while tanker safety improved after Valdez, the oil industry resisted new offshore drilling safety rules. It was reflective of a culture in the offshore oil industry. We ended up 20 years after Exxon Valdez with an even more serious incident, but no better prepared to avoid it or deal with it. The other oil companies, including Exxon, have denied that a systemic problem exists. We would not have drilled the well the way they did. Three years after the spill, new commitments have once again been made to improve spill prevention and response. Three years out from Exxon Valdez, there was still a deep commitment to applying the lessons that had been learned. Ten years out, that commitment had substantially eroded. If you come back in the year 2020 and ask, what have we learned? Are we safer? I think we'll know whether we really learned the lesson of Exxon Valdez.